Hey, hello everybody. It's Sven Hosford again with the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. I'm here a week two of my enforced summer vacation. Uh, I'm at Yana Kai in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, two weeks ago, you may know, I had a heart attack on my birthday. More accurately, I had a mold attack on my heart. I knew it was a mold attack because I'd already been twice to Toledo to be treated for mold poisoning by one of the world's top experts. So let's bring her on right now before she causes any more trouble. Charmaine Bassett Trims, the chief medicine <laughs> person here at Anyana Kai, and the woman who saved my life. So how are you doing tonight, Charmaine? Hey, I'm doing great, Sven. I'm glad to see you with all that color and doing so well. Oh my God, Linda looks like 10 years younger today. Wow. <laughs> I know. And well, Kitty is just having a ball. Kitty's here uh, being treated as well for mold poisoning, and she's just uh, taking over control of the captain's chair there in your office, I think. Yeah, you have to be careful when you sit because she blends in, <laughs> and a couple of times she almost got gushed. So, Well, I should tell people, um, you know, two weeks in, uh, 15 days now, with day 15 of the colonic a day, plus all the other treatments, and uh, most of my belly fat is gone. All these uh, crow's feet around my eyes, mostly gone. Uh, my varicose veins, mostly gone. Um, all my resentments, my anger, my my nasty attitude, my snarkiness. People aren't going to recognize me without all my snark. Oh my uh, God, you still got plenty of snark. Well, Don't be fooled. <laughs> oh well, yeah, I mean, some built into the system, but um, yeah, but it's anyway. coming from love, not anger. Now <laughs> that's <laughs> true. <laughs> Well, it's been a remarkable, remarkable two weeks, but the first thing I want to just, let's set the record straight uh, and talk about exactly how mold causes heart attacks and how it masks itself yeah. as something yeah. else. Yeah. Um, so you know, gonna I'm going to... Yeah, we're going to show the slide on the video. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, here's the thing, is you have, to, you have to understand there's only one discrepancy, I feel, with the biotoxic pathway chart. And that's only because there's still a large group of um, practicing doctors, researchers that believe that the DNA is the control mechanism. And I believe that it is only to a certain extent, but I believe in epigenetics that there is control factors above the gene and it has to do with the environment. So having said that, you know, according to Richie Shoemaker in the biotoxin pathway, he's a flipping genius. He truly is. I mean, I love his work. I've worked a lot with him. Um, but he says that you're born with an HLA genotype that makes you susceptible. Okay. And what I've come to find out is that, no, what ends up happening due to excessive or prolonged exposure, you end up mutating into this HLA susceptible genotype. So basically everyone is allergic to mold. It's not like Third, I yeah. have a mold allergy or you don't. Yeah. Correct. That's absolutely true. Um, and typically you're going to see this HLA genotype um, exposure show up quicker in individuals where their parent, the mother specifically, was exposed and then passed this on in utero. So that's why a lot of people come in with this HLA genotype susceptibility. Okay. But that's an um, epigenetic factor and not a genetic factor. Correct. You can control whether that gets turned on or not. And it, we do see this get turned around, which is the cool part. It's kind of tricky in today's environment, but it, it can be done. So I'm just going to quickly explain that the first thing that happens when you get this biotoxin exposure, and when we say mold, we must always classify this is not mold. This is mycotoxins, exotoxins, VOCs. It's a whole category that we just put into a very convenient mold. Um, but we also have to take a look at limes and all the spirochetes. We have to take a look at um, arachnid bites. Like uh, for me, it was a brown recluse spider. That's how I got involved with sure. this pathway because it really helped turn around some things I couldn't turn around other ways. So what ends up happening is your hypothalamus loses its ability to maintain homeostasis in the body. So the entire glandular system, which is controlled through epigenetic modulating balancing factors. So in other words, if you want your thyroid turned on, the hypothalamus will tell the pituitary, hey, kick out a little bit more thyroid stimulating hormone. Okay, then the hypothalamus, okay, that's enough. Okay, a little bit more, okay, just right. And of course that changes all throughout the day, considering what you come into, what time of the day it is, what food you eat, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. This happens with every single gland in the body. That's what the hypothalamus controls. It also controls all inflammation. So once you've been exposed, the inflammatory pathways are now overstimulated and stay overstimulated. So 
The new paradigm, which has been around for many, many years now, is that inflammation is the underlying cause of all disease. Right. So heart disease, we know, is an inflammatory issue. Having said that, we really shouldn't need to explain it any further. But for the people that really like to get into the science behind it, and there is plenty of it, let's just go right down the line of increased cytokines and what it means to, for, for instance, the capillaries. High cytokine levels in capillaries attract white blood cells, leading to restricted blood flow and lower oxygen levels. This, can, this is going to create stimulated vasoendothelial growth factor, TGFV1. And then when that reduced VEGF causes fatigue, muscle cramps, shortness of breath, which is what you went through. And that when, what ends up happening is the TGFV1 changes are going to interact with the Treg cells. When that happens, the immune response is going to become involved and your body is going to have an effect with the cardioleptins. The cardioleptins are what affect clotting in the body. So once again, here we see another cardiovascular issue. We also are going to end up with activation of the complement. That's another part of the immune system. And we're going to talk specifically about C4A. And the C4A has to do with hypoperfusion. So again, cardiovascular issue. We're also going to see problems with the blood and brain inflammatory pathway. So we're going to have problems with nerve, brain function, muscle problems, lung problems, and joints. But what ends up happening is the, when it combines with the PA1, it increases clot formation and causes arterial blockage. Okay, now I can continue on because we also have a downregulation and, and a misregulation in androgen. And why does a, a cardiovascular doctor give his patient um, an ACE inhibitor? Because we have a problem with testosterone. Um, so, and, and I can continue on down the rabbit hole, but I think that paints a pretty good picture for, you know, doctors who are trying to understand, you know, how does mold poisoning give somebody a heart attack? I think that's going to give them a pretty good clue, but let's go just one step further and say, when you're exposed to the mold, most of it is going to be breathe, sinuses, right. lungs, sinuses drain where the lymphatic aspect of the sinuses drain into the right side of the heart. So now you've got blood that's going to end up thicker with more pathogenic burden in there. And that thickness that's in the lymphatic system, that's trying to, that's going to be the, um, that's going to be not the red part of the blood, but the yellow part of the blood called the plasma. Okay. That's, that will drain from the sinuses and it'll end up being the plasma part of the blood. Okay. is going to be loaded with all these trapped proteins, these trapped mold cells. And so the body's going to then kick up additional enzymes to try to break down anything that's dead, damaged, diseased, or does not belong. And that's where when you go into the hospital and they see the elevated enzymes, they say, okay, that's a marker for heart attack. What you're really looking at is you're looking at trapped proteins that have not been handled by the body. Mm -hmm. And when you have an excessive amount of these, you can go into something called like anaphylactic shock is something most people are familiar with. Um, that is a symptom of mold exposure. So I think that kind of kind of full circles it to give you an idea of the many different venues by which mold can actually create a cardiovascular event. Um, so yeah, and I tell you, I'm glad you use all those technical terms because I'll never be able to repeat all that or probably understand it. But having lived it, I know you're telling the truth. You know. Yeah, and, and the shortness of breath was probably the scariest thing for you, right? Uh, well, the numbness. You know, occasionally I get numbness in my left arm. Um, and that even happened, you know, a couple of days after. Um, yeah, so numbness is a very direct indication of mold poisoning. You'll feel kind of like your lips a lot of times, all the things that they call a heart attack. Because if you think about it, anaphylactic shock and heart attack kind of mean the same thing for some of the cardiovascular events. And that's exactly what is happening. So that numbness is due to the mold exposure. Absolutely. That's well, one of the things that we say. The first thing that we ask people, though, the easiest way to know if the mold exposure has reached a toxic burden to the point to where you're now expressing symptoms that can be you know very detrimental to your health is because these molds and toxins are cumulative is something called a visual contrast screening so if you have problems seeing um the difference between white and black and then the gray in between you can actually google visual contrast screening test and you can pull that up and then you can take this very simple test and then if, if you flunk that test you don't pass it properly you automatically know that you've had some aspect of this biotoxin pathway activated 
some sort of exposure, whether wow. it be limes, an arachnid bite, like a, a brown recluse, mold, spiral keep, hysteria, something along this level. What, give me that uh, visual what? Contrast screening, BCS. Contrast. Yeah, okay. BCS screening. All right, we'll get that one up too on the, uh, on the video. Um, well, I do need to say too that one of the reasons I put my life in your hands basically and turn myself, check myself out of the ER was because uh, having been to you a couple of times before, I was using your fungal pain formula here, FNG, which we affectionately call fungu. Um, I had been using it on my on my uh, varicose veins that I've had since I was 18 years old. When I, you know, I thought it was from working on my feet in the bookstore. When it was actually from, uh, I had moved in the basement and uh, moved my bedroom into the basement of the house that we lived in in Western Pennsylvania, a mold infested basement. And I was sleeping in that environment for eight hours a day. So those varicose veins with your FNG fighter, buy it right here at Danyanakai, almost gone, even before I had my little episode with the emergency room. So talk a, lot, a little bit about what's in here and how it is so powerful. I can't tell you what's in there. If I told you that, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's actually, <laughs> <laughs> that's actually a formula that dad um, started with probably about oh, I don't know, 30 years ago, and as processing of different plant constituents and chemicals have gotten more profound and more precise, um, I've just perfected it as, as the years have gone on. The basis of it is DMSO. Um, DMSO should be used for everything. It, it really is the wonderful snake oil, real snake oil. It does work for everything. And uh, I mean, the, the most astonishing research I ever read was where they took down syndrome children and gave them DMSO and changed their chromosomes so that they weren't down syndrome anymore. I figure oh, if it can man. do that, yeah, if it can do that, it can pretty much do about anything, right? Wow. Yeah. So it, we, we put that with um, several different essential oils, um, some herbs, the Hoxy formula, the Hoxy cancer formula is in there. Um, it's been improved a little bit again because we've, you know, just able to do so much more with herbs. Um, there's d limonene, which is a terpene it's, uh, that's very well and profoundly used uh, for gastro, um, gastro distress, gallbladder, gallstones, lung cancer, esophageal cancer, prostate, any of the female cancers. Um, just works fantastic. It's, so it's many amazing. different ways. Yeah, yeah, so many different ways. We use the d -limonene. That's in there. I've got cayenne in there and ginger in there and get the idea. It's, it's basically probably about oh, 75 maybe different items are in there. Wow. Um, and it's just fantastic for everything. Pain, well, I'll give pain, a testimony to it, yeah. But I, mean, yeah, I have people that, that have had like migraines their whole life and, you know, again, it's, it's going to be proper use. It's establishing the dose, saturating the receptor sites, but it will actually work as a pain block. It's that powerful, when, again, when used properly. And, and the least amount that you should use this particular product is three times a day topically. Oh, okay. uh, it, it could be more depending on what you're going through what type of environment you're living in, et cetera. I know I found a lot of relief from putting it right along the station tube and the lymph channels running from like, across the face down. Yeah, that's your major drainage for your entire head si and sinus, right. eyes, the whole nine yards. So, you know, when you see an eye problem, you got to know that, again, the eyes are going to get hit with whatever's in the environment, so exposure, and it's going to end up in the lack of you know, the glands behind the eye, around the eye. And so getting that area cleaned up is really, really difficult and getting it, keeping it drained is really difficult. So again, any problems with eyes, sinuses, mouth, taste, hearing, any of that, we want to open up the drainage channels through the neck. So yeah, that's a really great place to put that on. Okay. Well, let's, uh, there was one question that came up from the last week's podcast. Uh, one of our viewers uh, contacted me to ask, um, how are people in the tropics who live in tropical environments, especially uh, natives to those areas, uh, people that live in the jungles and the rainforests, are they affected by mold? Or are they as affected by mold? Do they have the same problems we do? Or what's the story with all that? Um, here's the thing. So Toledo, Ohio, where I'm at, called Frog Town. And it was a black swamp, which are way worse than the tropics, okay? Black swamp, um, until they drug drainage juices around it. Like I've said before, and I think your last podcast is, um, we have some of the highest levels of aspergillus and penicillium in the world. So that's not the problem. The problem is, is when we get it trapped indoors and we don't have a proper positive airflow. 
you, when you're outside, you've got your natural airflow that keeps everything moving and circulating. And then you've got the plants, which are going to give you what you need oxygen wise. So the amount of, and then you have UV rays hitting everything and UV rays prevent mold from going too excessive. Because think about this, if you're in like, let's say a, a tropical area, the areas where you see the mold are going to be where there's not a lot of sunlight, where there's excessive moisture and where there's very little air flow. That's not going to be where the natives live. Okay. Natives are going to live on the, in the areas where there's more light, where there's more airflow, and where there's more plant life and oxygen. So having and more water again, which brings in you know the water as into drink, not water as in moisture. Um, so the, if you have a positive airflow constantly happening, you're not going to get the excessive spores. Okay, so, so it's, it, it's indoor. It's indoor construction. And, and, and lack of consideration for positive air pressure and flow that becomes the problem. Well, let's get this right into the topic then uh, at hand, which is uh, remediating your home, getting the mold out of your home and all the different steps. And the I'm on a ball. Like, yeah, I get I'm on that. the ball in case people are wondering. <laughs> You're on the ball in more ways than yeah. one, I can tell you that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But um, so the first step in home remediation, uh, or just oh my God, I'm going, I'm going through it right now at my mom's house. That's why yeah. you see me. That's why you see me itching and constantly drinking and putting on lip balm is because one of the things that happens is your anti-diuretic hormone, your vasopressin. You, no matter how much you drink, you're just constantly dry. So that's another. Again, blood pressure would be affected. So again, come back to cardiovascular. If you're affecting water levels in the body, you're going to affect blood pressure, aren't you? But I'm just saying, I have a hard time. You'll see me itching my eyes, you know, and you'll see me itching my nose a lot. And so, yeah, it, it gets really tricky. But there is a very specific way to, to clean up your indoor environment. And, and when I went shopping for houses, coming back up from Florida, I mean, I looked at 500 houses. There's only five I bid on. I said this before. And why I bid on five was not because they were clean, but because I could get them clean and keep them clean. And, and really, that's what people have to take a look at. I mean, there were some houses after Katrina even taking them all the way down to the studs, they could not get rid of the mold. Yeah. So again, there are ways to clean you know, up these in indoor environments and there's ways that are absolutely more toxic, a waste of time and money and are gonna actually get you more sick. So it's, it's a huge consideration. And I mean, I interviewed here in Toledo, before I finally came up with somebody that really knew what they were doing, five or six you know, fire, water, remediating companies and they actually end up taking out pads and taking notes for me. So like, yeah. how do you know this? And they were taking notes and I'm like, okay, I guess I won't be using you, you know? So yeah. So um, first is you need to find out where your issue is coming from. Um, you know, you look along your ceiling, you look, you look along like wherever you might have a drain, a sink, a dishwasher, a refrigerator, anywhere where you've got water coming into the house. Or especially As, if you know there's mold coming in through a crack in, uh, in the wall or a ceiling. Right, exactly. Roof leak, a chimney leak, whatever may be the case. But even if you don't have any of those issues, if you have a basement to a first floor, if that's all you have, and of course you may go up even higher than that, a second floor, an attic, whatever. But if you just have a basement to a, to a first floor, the amount of degree of temperature and humidity as you walk up those stairs, okay, creates something called a flashpoint, which creates condensation. So if the outside of your basement is not waterproof properly, and we're talking about French drain, proper grade, grade away from the house, down out to the, you know, the street or what, you know, whatever your surrounding area, so higher ground, so to speak, um, and then where you actually would tar and then this queen or use that heavy duty plastic on the outside, you know, you're, you're going to have a mold issue. And then even if you do that, you have to make sure that you're controlling the humidity downstairs. So that it matches the humidity on the first floor so you're not trying to create more humidity you're trying to dehumidify if anything now obviously in the winter time that gets a little bit trickier but you should always in your basement there needs to be dehumidifiers going and you need to have some way to vent outside you have to be able to vent That's some okay. air out vent some air outside and it needs to be constantly running it's not something you want to turn off and on and that's not even getting into, and I think I, I think you know Jim Roby said he'd come on and talk for the more advanced class, which you definitely need to get him on. He was my mentor through all this. Um, but you know, then if you have something like a crawl space or some of the other issues that can be going on, that those get a lot more complicated. And I'm not even going to get into that right now yeah. because we, a we don't have enough time, and b I just need people to understand the 
basic premise so that they know what to do to clean up that basement, to clean up the house. Because let's say, for instance, your problem was a um, uh, 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 bathroom. Let's say a plumbing issue in the bathroom. Now, first and foremost, you're going to take care of the plumbing issue in the bathroom. But if you have a, a central heating and AC unit, you know, if you have central, if you have duct system as opposed to like a radiant system, then you, you need to know that the mold is in your entire house. There's no such thing as it's just in the bathroom. And that's where people make the biggest mistake, you see. They go down to the basement, they see that water issue, they see the mold, they smell the mold, and they think once they clean the basement, they're okay. What they don't realize is because they have a central air system, air handling system, it's throughout the entire house. And yep. that's what gets to be tedious. That's what gets to be overwhelming. And that's where people usually drop the ball, including a lot of the companies that come in to clean because you have to touch every single thing in your house. I mean, I, I we had you freezing books that you loved. Yeah, I'm, we're going to get into that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm freezing pictures at my mom's house is that, that's important to her that she's not going to obviously squirt a liquid onto. Right. Um, you know, so, I mean, everything has to be taken care of. So if you want to just do the simplest steps to do that, I go and I get the big, I was trying to see if I could reach one real quick in here, but I can't. But I go and I get the big plastic tubs, preferably the see-through, so you don't have to do a bunch of labeling. Okay. And you're going to take everything, and you're going to put it in this bin, and you're going to get it out of the house in a pod. You're going to rent a pod if you can afford it. If you can't afford a pod, you're going to make a clean area. It could be your garage. If it's your garage, you got to first remediate your garage, and then that'll be your holding area. If you can't afford a bunch of plastic bins to do this, you can get the big construction bags, the garbage bags. Now make sure you don't get the scented ones because that scent is going to get it all in your clothes and now you got chemicals and mold. Yeah. It's a double whammy. It's a bigger problem, okay? so and, and most of them don't even say it on the label anymore. The big construction bags. So the easiest way to clean your place, and this is in a way it's kind of cool because what most people are going to realize, all the possessions that they have are actually weighing them down. Yeah. And, and they probably should get rid of like 90% of what's there anyway. And if they don't see it out of sight, out of mind, but it's really not because it still weighs heavy on you, it's still possession. It's taking up space that could be used for something else in your life. So it's a great opportunity to clean up your house. So what you first do is you get your clean area, whether it be a pot outside, which is what I have, or a garage, which I've done that before too. And then everything has to come out of your house. So as you're taking it out of the house in this construction bag or in this plastic bin, you're deciding one of three things. I'm going to keep it, I'm going to give it away, I'm going to throw it away. You have to decide one of those three things, and then it goes into the spot accordingly. All right? So you've got everything tied up, everything's out of the house. In the basement, we're going to use a high-powered 35% hydrogen peroxide that actually contains products so that you can get a deeper penetration of the product. Regular hydrogen peroxide will not do this. So now every beam in the ceiling every yeah. stud every cinder block is going to be super i'm talking about you're going to get a heavy duty pewter duty um fogger i actually have a fogger that i that i own because i help so many people with this excuse me kombucha kombucha baby <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um you can actually rent them from like home depot and it's this fog that it'll kick out a lot of spray so you get a nice coverage and you're just going to blast everything super super saturated i mean you want it wet okay you want it totally totally wet and now, then you're, you're gonna let me ask a question when you're doing this should you take any extra like if i'm doing this or linda's doing this should we take any extra precautions should we wear mask ask oh mask, my god actually suit? yeah you really should be in the hazmat suit hazmat suit but most people aren't going to do that so if you can at least wear a really good mask super good mask or respirator Okay, and then just immediately shower, wash out, ozone, you know, your eyes, your ears, you know, your rectum. You got to do some insufflations so you can knock it down and really scrub yourself off good. Otherwise, you're just, you know, once again, recontamination. And you're coming from the from the pan into the fire if you're coming from the basement to upstairs. So, yeah, that's just really, yes, great question. Most people should do this in hazmat. It depends on how extensive the mold is and what kind it is. Uh, but, yeah, better safe than sorry with something like that, especially if you're already sick, you know? Well, yeah, but especially, like, we're we're moving into a house. We've got a great landlord. God bless her. She's a wonderful lady. Sounds but like cool. any, any home that's got two apartments and a basement uh, and has got, you know, a fairly high turnover over the years has got probably, what, 20 families. Uh, well, the last 10 years' worth of dust 
50 years worth of dust in the basement and all this contamination from all those families and everything that's gone in there is all in the rafters in that dust so that's what i'm thinking and you know linda and i were talking at lunch like well geez you know we're gonna have to wear hazmat suits to go down there and yeah. do this stuff yeah hey and they have the really nice ones now that are kind of like lightweight they're not expensive and they're kind of throwaway type of things yeah, yeah I was gonna and say, they work, out, they work out really well they do and that's what we tend to use like when i grow in crawl spaces i put on a hazmat suit i'm not growing in anybody's crawl space without that on that loot. if you do that you're an idiot i'm sorry i don't like to call people names but you can't do that you just can't well, do that especially people like us who've already hit our toxic limit once you know right and, and yeah but why 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 challenge that it's just because once well, you get there it's just so tough yeah, you so want to, yeah it's so tough so the well, whole let's thing talk is, about let me just ask this one now so you say clean out the ductworks what what do you want the the company that comes and cleans out your ductwork what do you want them to do and not do is there any specific instructions? Well, but you, you're, no, cleaning out the ducts is the last thing that you do. The last thing, okay. No, no, no. So let's let's just do this one step at a time. Okay. So you're going to super saturate down there, mm -hmm. okay? And you're going to put a you're going to put some fans down there, so so it dries up. And then when everything's dried up, you got to get a super high powered, hospital grade HEPA vacuum cleaner, and you're going to HEPA vac everything. Because here's the thing, when you say there's a lot of dust, that that dust is loaded with mold. So oh, no. Anytime you see dust anywhere, anywhere, you know that that's a mold trap, all right? And it's also a dead particle trap, which is every bit as deadly. Here's the thing is a lot of people know how to kill mold, but once they kill that mold, now you've got all those dead particles, that stuff is every bit as toxic as the mold is, okay? Well, and that's that's the, the second part. I know this is a two-part way. You've got to kill the right, mold, so, and you've got to remove it without toxic. Right. So you're going to go ahead and you're going to HEPA back all that, and then you're going to take a product I call Biostat, and you're gonna you're gonna take that fogger and you're gonna saturate everything again. Now guess what? Once that's on there, it's not gonna get mold again for a year. How about that? And I put that I put that to extreme water water out under my hot tubs. I go under there every six months to year in Biostat. You know that's all wood down there that has been flooded so many times because we have a drainage problem underneath the building here, and that's never had mold down there. So that's that that proves me everything I need to know. That stuff's crazy. So now well, let's go. Well, so let's get the product. Biostat. Biostat, yes. Biostat. Jim Roby is going to talk a little bit more about that, but we do carry that. That is Here. available for people. Yes. So now let's go upstairs. Okay. And wait, 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 wait. Let's finish downstairs. So now you've biostated everything. You're good. You got your dehumidifier set up. You got your sup pump covered. Okay. You got the. You got it so that the dehumidifier drains into the sup, and you got a rubber cover, not a wooden cover, because you can imagine that's going to be a problem too. You get one of those rubber covers and you custom make it so you got that sup pump covered. Okay, then you got to make sure that you're you've done waterproof around your basement, like we talked about, with the French drain, the tar, the tarp around, and that you're well graded all the way out far enough that you've got good drainage for your house and your basement. You're in, you're in okay shape there. Now your basement's okay, which is typically the biggest problem in most in most living areas. Okay, preferably a slab. Basements are just a really bad idea if somebody's building. You really don't really want to build a basement. You just don't want to do it. Just too hard. Just because of the fact of being underground and that it's going to create a you know a flashpoint and that even if you know what you're doing it's still hard to really get that right unless you hematically seal your whole house you know what i'm saying come on and that's just going to be a, a fortune unto itself so now let's go up to like living areas so now like living space you don't need to use the hydrogen peroxide and you're probably not going to want to because think about it that's going to bleach things it can it's very caustic it can do some damage to some things so what you're going to get is you're going to do the same thing you did downstairs in the basement but you're going to use a product called Stericelli. Stericelli. Now spell that one out. <laughs> really? Yeah. S-T-E-R-I-C-H-E-L-L-I. -L -L -I. Hey, I think I did it. <laughs> Stericelli. I think I did. And that's another product that we carry that Jim's going to talk a little bit more about. Um, but that's what you're going to use. Now, every single thing from the floor, I mean, from the ceiling to the floor, all walls, everything has got to be sprayed. It has to sit on for half an hour. If you wiped off, then everything has to be hepa vac again. Carpets usually have to go. But there are carpet steamers that you can get, and you can take that high heat and run the Stericelli through that and save carpets as long as they're not too old because think the padding and all that stuff underneath there. So if, if, if they're too old, you're best just take it, it and just get rid of that carpet. So when you wipe down the walls after you put the Stericelli on, any special precautions there? Same thing. You're, you know, it's not going to be as bad as the basement unless that's where the problems are. In my mom's house, our problem is, was the, was the roof and the chimney. So it's in, it was in that area. 
So if I'm opening up an area that we found black mold in, heck yeah, I'm doing full precautionary there. But for most people, it, it's going to be the basement. Nine times out of nine, it's going to be basement. So when you get up there, usually a mask will, will do the job and just a good shower afterwards. But then after you wipe everything down, you're going to have to once again HEPA back everything, ceilings, uh, walls, floors, everything, all your furniture, everything's out of the house, every picture, every utensil, everything's out of the house. And then once again, you biostat everything. Your house is now done. And then what you're going to do is to not overwhelm yourself because otherwise it's overwhelming and it'll never get done. You bring those plastic, either trash bags, or bins in one at a time and you remediate each one of those one at a time. Some things cannot be remediated. Some furniture cannot be remediated. Some mattresses cannot be remediated. Pillows, questionable, you know, books. You gotta freeze them and then you have to have back every single page. Every pictures, page. pictures, same thing, front and back. Everything has to be touched. Every corner, every angle, everything. Otherwise you can be contaminated. But here's the thing. Once you've got that house remediated, and once you've got everything out and you're just bringing in small amounts of stuff at a time, what you're going to find that's really cool is that a lot of that stuff that you haven't seen in the couple months that you're remediating, you really don't miss. Yeah, it's just a really nice way to clean up your life. It's just a wonderful way to feng shui. Everything that less is more. Yeah. Uh, but on top of that, you also want to make sure that you set up a good induct system. I like to use the hydroxyl ion. I like to use a catalytic converter. I actually carry those by Aeroasis with a really high um, filtration, micron filtration in the actual, um, where the filters go in the system. You want to keep your fan on all the time so you keep a positive air pressure. So your fans are always going. Ceiling fans in your big rooms that push the heat down in the summertime and lift the heat up in the wintertime that have a reverse on them. Uh, bedrooms probably, I would even do a, a standalone filter in bedrooms and main living space just to make sure I'm really handling my air quality so that you never end up with this problem again. Um, and then your ducts need to be clean completely and the air in the house. Okay. Because if you just clean the ducts without cleaning the air, that's crazy. Sean says that's like, a, you know, taking your dipstick out of your car, wiping the oil off and then sticking it back into the dirty oil. So you're not just cleaning, and that's the thing is most companies just clean ducts. They don't clean the ducts and pressurize and clean all the air. Mm. You have to have both. After all that's been done, then you get that induct system. You keep your positive airflow, and you get your ducts clean once a year, and you just wash, watch for any water intrusion. Any water intrusion, if you clean it up within 24 hours, you're going to be fine. And, yeah, you got the products. you got your hydrogen peroxide. You've got your Stericelli. You have your HEPAVAC, and you have your Biostat. You're going to know how to keep your place mold free. That's not cleaning it up. It's keeping it clean. Yeah. Yeah. You can see that. And so those, those are the basic steps yeah. there. So let me ask a couple of specific questions then. Um, spider plants. I have a whole bunch of plants that were inside during the winter and now are outside on the front porch. Uh, Got to go or? No, no. You want your plants. Your plants are going to absolutely help. But is there mold what, inside the dirt? What you're going to do is you're going to, you're going to go get some enzymes. Some plant okay. enzymes, and because you got to remember, plants feed off of mold. So in the plants, it's not uh -huh. so bad. And then they take that and they'll eat that, and the enzymes will help break it down faster. So, okay. okay, and even okay. some water with some hydrogen peroxide, and it works really well too. Okay. And you can even mist the leaves and wipe them off, or just spray them off with the hose. You can mist the leaves and then just spray them off with the hose. Let them sit outside in the sunlight. You'll be fine. Uh, I'm so glad. So you want glad. a lot of you want a lot of plants in your house. Plants are wonderful for keeping the air clean. That's well. I kept them in during the all winter, and I was afraid that um, they were going to be too toxic to bring back in next time. So. No, no, no. You want those plants? You can remediate those too. Everything has to be touched. That's great. Well, we've covered a whole bunch of one important thing, and this is a part of our uh, amazing journey here. Um, after we left the uh, ER and took us about a day to get ready to travel the four hours to Toledo, it actually took us twenty-four hours to make that four-hour drive. I know it. That was so crazy. And we, I know we were calling you like every hour. Oh my hour. God, Sven, so, I swear to God, that was so crazy. I mean, they really were because he, yeah. he, no, he was ha felt like he was having a heart attack like every four hours. Should I go to the ER? When do I make a decision whether I'm going to the ER or not was the question. I was Don't tracking you just love it when somebody way. puts their heart attack in your hands like that? 
luckily I'm as confident as I am that I knew what I was doing because any other doctor would have never taken that liability. I'm the crazy nut lunatic out here though. So I don't know. I just felt pretty confident. I just felt pretty confident. I knew what was going on. Well, so. you, you had actually done some very specific testing with your microcurrent machines. You knew what the, the mold level was in my system. You knew my, my history. Um, since I've been here, I've realized that every single health issue I've had in my entire life has been because of mold. Isn't that something? It's, I know it. I know it. It's crazy. It blows me away. I know it. And, and just to, to round out this podcast, because I think we need to do a, a whole podcast on Yeah, just we're good. Let's mold. do that. I really want to do that so people have the info they need. But just, yeah. just to round it out, I mean, uh, it, literally every single thing, and, and I love what you say too, is that the toxic... The toxins come before the negative emotions, which... Oh, you know, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, emotions. thanks for bringing that up. Because, you know, it, it, it's crazy when someone says, oh, you know, you're having a heart attack. Well, you need to fix your heart. I'm like, OMG. I'm going to show you that when we clear this mold, that all that anger and frustration that you feel is gone, it's and gone. your heart already is open. It doesn't get a chance. We already know it that, you know, it's been proven that those HLA receptors work as antennas to pull your soul into your body. So now, if we mutate those because of mold exposure, and then we stop the block of proper lymph flow, blood flow, hormone flow, because of that down regulation of the hypothalamus, and we're killing off our probiotic status that is beneficial to our health, which we already know controls emotions, digestion, immune system, and all this stuff is out of whack, who are you really? So once we eliminate that burden, knock it down i mean in two weeks it's like you said you're not angry you're not frustrated you know all these things that you thought you were supposed to be working on because what a bad human being you must be that you have not handled all your anger and frustration shame on you Sven. you are not a very good practitioner are you i mean that's just you, must have, you must have talked to all my ex-girlfriends that's just a bunch of yeah. full malarkey okay because <laughs> i know i know that when I get hit with mold, all of a sudden I get really anxious. It's hard for me to settle down. I get my buttons get pushed really easy. And I know that's not me because I know what I just got exposed to. And I felt what actually happened in my human body. So I was lucky because I started off really healthy and then felt what these exposures do to me when they happen to me enough to know. And then that's when I realized, oh my God, here we are treating all these people for these psychological, like Louise Hayes type of scenarios. Okay. And, and it, it's just laying so much guilt on an already stressed out system, it cannot be productive at the end of the day. So just to say for all you people out there, you know, that are meant to feel guilty because you haven't conquered this emotional aspect of yourself, I, I promise you, I promise you that when you clean this stuff out of your system, easy peasy, non-issue, you know, the real you will be there and your soul will come back into your body cold. It's not even going to be difficult. I, I, and I gotta say, that's exactly what it feels like. It feels like my soul came back into my body about eight days in. Yeah. Uh, don't want to get too graphic, but the amount of mucus that comes out during colonics. Oh my God. Is unbelievable. Yeah, my, I know. My belly fat is almost all gone. Oh yeah, yeah. You've it's really trimmed crazy. down. It's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. It is crazy, and it's it's just unbelievable, you know, that it's so prevalent. I mean, truly, my daughter. Did travel volleyball for eight years, seven, I don't, something crazy. So almost every weekend, you're in a vehicle driving somewhere to a hotel. It got to the point to where I just kept a bed. I just kept all the seats down in the van, and I just slept in the back of the van because I wouldn't even go into most of the hotels. I just couldn't well, do it. That was uh, another part of the adventure here was three hotel rooms and three nights, and the third right. one almost killed me. So yep. that's why we live here in the clinic with sleeping on the massage tables. It's kind of an interesting experience, I have to say, but uh, it's, uh, I have such a- ah, come on, you're having fun and you know it. Well, I, it's a, it's the most interesting summer camp I've ever been to. I, mean, <laughs> I know, right? I get, well, all the things they put up my rectum, it's just amazing. But, uh, <laughs> it seems, Mr. Sphincter is not real happy right now, but uh, in general, I feel oh, so- Oh, he's loving life. Better. What are you talking about? The other alternative <laughs> was way worse. <laughs> well, I think if I, it's a way better alternative than having my chest cracked open or tubes put, more tubes put in my arteries because they couldn't right. diagnose it in the first place. But uh, it's, such a, it's such a joy to have you on again. We're going to do this a few more times to cover all the basics of mold. Yeah, we but, haven't uh, done the car yet. We haven't done the car yet, and we oh, also oh, car. Oh, yeah, yeah. We'll yeah, look, yeah, yeah. And we also need to do like once you get the mold out of your system, what can you do to reset the hypothalamus so that your body actually works properly again? Because 
getting the mold outs not the big biggest thing it's fixing the broken parts <laughs> okay from the toxic burden that are that get to be a little bit L I, actually that's the trickiest part but it, it, there are ways to do it well let's save that for a future podcast um this is uh, another exciting week here i'll probably be recording from here next week um we're also going to have dr michael gregor on next week uh, that's going to be really fun he's going to be in pittsburgh coming up in early july so we'll get the details out about that but uh, for now, let's uh, wrap this one up. Thanks again, Charmaine. It's great to have you on again. And, Thank you. Uh, until next week, you be careful out there. <laughs>